I want to go to the book, uh, Letter of Ephesians. One of my favorite uh, places in the Bible. As a matter of fact, I did a whole series on this and still left messages untouched because there was so much, there's so much in this amazing letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And I want to uh, read uh, beginning with chapter 5 and verse 14. <clears throat> but everything, or actually, well, let me pick up 13 so I get the whole sentence. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. I'm already getting some amens there in the front row. <laughs> Making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. Father, thank you so much for this word. Speak again in Christ's name. Amen. I'm wondering how many folks out there, uh, I, I was going to say dads, but I imagine there's some moms that might be involved in this too. You, uh, you got some really cool Christmas gift for your kids and you were so excited to see their eyes as they got this wonderful new electronic toy of some some sorts only to discover after they unwrapped it and took it out of the box that the batteries are not included <laughs> and you just don't happen to have a store of 12 size d batteries sitting in your house and so the stores are closed and you have no way anybody been in that place before you know, okay or you went out and you got something, it wasn't necessarily Christmas, but you, you suddenly realize, I don't have the batteries, it doesn't work, I need the power to make it happen. There's, there's, it's important to understand that, that, that there is power that's needed to operate some of these things. I heard this story recently about a, uh, 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 a man who went to the World's Fair a number of years ago, and as he, as, he, as he went to the fair, he was walking around, seeing all the incredible sights. And off in the distance, he saw a man dressed in ornate oriental clothing. And he was, he was pumping a, a pump that was you know, turning a wheel. And this water was flowing out of this, this thing at, at a very you know, very massive amount. He's, he was really impressed. Man, that guy is, he, the strokes were smooth and they were strong. He's like, man, that guy's got to be really strong to be making that happen. And so, you know, but it was, it was way across the, the, the way. And so he decided to go check it out. So he walked way over to where this, this, uh, this display was. And the closer he got, the more he realized it was not a human man, but the man was made out of wood. And the man was not turning the pump, but the water was flowing through this thing in such a way that the water was turning the man. And it struck me as I thought about that. I said, you know, that's really what it's all about to be filled with the Holy Spirit, is that God is turning us. God's power is taking our just human weakness, and somehow or another makes us do supernatural and amazing things. That's what we need in life. Now, last Sunday, I preached on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we talked about baptism as being dipping into something, immersing into something, okay? And so we, we understand that the baptism in the Spirit is where Jesus immerses you into, in the person of the Holy Spirit and the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit, and that transforms you. This week I want to talk about being filled with the Spirit. Now a lot of people use those terms interchangeably, but I want you to see that they're different. There's something different about it. In the same way that we looked at there's different baptisms, and that you can tell which was which by determining who the baptizer is and what the element is that you're being baptized in. Well, I want you to also see that being 
filled with the Spirit is different in its essence and in its purpose than being baptized with the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit can be in you, and yet you can know very little of His power and His influence. The issue that we always have to deal with is not how much of the Holy Spirit that we have. Because guess what? If you are a born-again Christian, you have all of the Holy Spirit. The question is, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? And that's where we really get into what being filled with the Spirit is all about. Now, the, the text I just read you out of Ephesians there, it talks about uh, certain things that's, that's important to understand. And that is, uh, as we look at our need of the, of the Spirit's filling, I want you to see that it is possible, it is possible to be a Christian and yet, if you just walk through these verses with me, be asleep. You know there's a lot of Christians that are sleeping, and I don't mean in my sermons, okay? Although the, I see that happen too. But it is, it is not that, that, that we are asleep physically, it is that we are asleep spiritually and mentally. It is also possible that a, you can be a Christian and yet waste your time. He says, be careful how you live. You know, so there's people that live wastefully. There are chunks of hours and days and weeks and months and years that go by with nothing effective happening in our lives. We can waste a lot of time. It's also possible to be a Christian and yet be unwise. Not every Christian has instant supernatural wisdom. Not every person, just because you came to know Jesus Christ, is able to have all the wisdom of God flowing through every decision they make and every word that comes out of their mouth. As a matter of fact, I've heard a lot of unwise comments. Even some come from me. And it is possible to be a Christian and yet not know God's will. I know some Christians who, they don't have a clue what God's will is. They, they love God, they, they, they've, they've received His forgiveness, they put their faith in Christ for their salvation, but yet they don't know the will of God. And so it is important to understand that these are are part of the need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. These verses all lead up to the key verse, which is verse 18. I haven't read that yet. And let me read it now. He says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to another in, with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So it is, it's important to see that, that we have all probably made the above mistakes there, okay? Uh, if anybody hasn't made at least one of those where you've not been asleep or wasted time or been unwise or not known God's will, okay, you're probably fooling yourself. You definitely are fooling yourself. All right? So... I want to suggest today that the reason we make those kinds of errors in our lives is because we are not filled with the Holy Spirit at those moments. He is not the dominating influence in our lives. Let me explain. To be filled with the Spirit means to be controlled by the Spirit. The Spirit of God wants to control our lives. Some of you get scared when you hear that. It sounds kind of cultic-like. Okay? I'm not talking about me controlling you. I'm not talking about some, some, you know, uh, some cult leader controlling you with mind control. I'm talking about God himself having control of our lives. He wants to control our lives so that we can wake up spiritually, we can be wise spiritually, we can stop being foolish spiritually, and so that we can know what God's will is for our lives. It is only when these things operate in us that we can live the victorious Christian life. Now here's something that I want to say, which you'll probably agree with, but then I want to take it to another level here, and that's this. It is impossible 
to live the Christian life on our own. Christianity, becoming a Christian, is not about joining a church, not about becoming part of a club, it's not about simply agreeing to certain tenets of faith and saying, yeah, I, I can go along with that. No, it, you, and then just saying, well, I'm going to, you know, clean up my act a little bit and I'm going to, you know, stop doing a few of the bad things I used to do and, and, and start doing a few of the things that, you know, the church thinks I ought to do. No, that's not it. All right? To live for Christ is impossible without him, his help. If you could do it, you would not need the Holy Spirit. In John 15, 5, Jesus said this, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so he sent us another helper. Now here's the part I want you to catch. It might take it to another level. You may not have thought it all the way through here, so I want to, I if you have, great, but I want to take it to this level here for you to understand. When you got saved, not lose your fleshly desires. Some of you are like, well, of course, amen. How come not, you know? And you, you wish you had. But when you got saved, how many of you know your fleshly desires are still there? The desire to do sinful things, the desire to, 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 to do selfish things are still there. You're like, what did I sign up for if they're not gone? How come they're, not, how come they're still there? Your flesh, which in, the, in, the, in, the, in certain translations it calls the flesh, it is not your body, it's not your skin, it is your sinful nature that you were born with. It is as corrupt today as the day when you were lost. The sinful nature is the same. It is just as corrupt. That means that in your own strength, your attempts at self-improvement will not be any more successful today than when you were in your unconverted state. This is what many people don't catch when it comes to Christianity. They think, all right, I, you know, I said a prayer, I, I, I went to membership class, I did this, I did that, so I'm good, right? And then you try to, you know, you set your New Year's resolutions. How many has a New Year's resolution that goes past January 10th? Okay, I mean, you know, because we try to do those things in our own strength. And so when we try to live the Christian life in our own strength, we fail miserably, and then we feel terrible about it. If the Christian life is a supernatural life, then we need supernatural help to live it. You can't do it on your own, and neither can I. It's not that I'm better than you or that I'm more seasoned than you. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. Have you ever gritted your teeth after committing the same sin for the umpteenth time? And have you, have you ever said then, well, I'm never going to do it again. I quit. I stop now. God, I, I, re, I renounce that. I repent of that. I will never do that sin again. Have you ever said, have you ever lied to yourself like that? <laughs> Tell the truth and shame the devil. Sincerity is not the problem. The desire to change is not the problem. If I were to sit down individually with everyone in the room today and say, what, what kind of changes would you like to see God do in your life in the next 12 months? You could probably give me a good list. But you can't do any of that by yourself. You will fail miserably. It's not that you don't want to see change. It's that you don't have the power to change yourself. The power to change only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, filling with the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that a little bit more. For, for, in, uh, under B in your outline there, four observations about the Spirit's filling. Right out of this text. First of all, it's God's command. He says, be filled. It is not a suggestion. It is a command. Okay? God's not saying, you know, I'd really like it if you might consider being filled with the Spirit. 
God doesn't say, well, you know, if you're really serious and you're a super Christian, then, then you know, you should get filled with the Spirit. But all of you who just, you know, want to be a Sunday morning Christian, that's, that's okay. You don't need it. No, no. He says, be filled. Amen. Number two, it is for every believer. This is not a just some people thing. In the Greek text, the command is, the, is in the plural. When he says, be filled, he's, it's a plural word. You don't see that in the English. It doesn't bear itself out. But you, if you, in, in the Greek text, which, which is the original language here, it applies to all Christians. Thirdly, God does it. Be filled, he says. He doesn't say, fill yourself. He says, be filled. In other words, God is the one that has to do it. Amen. We simply have to be a vessel that says, God, fill me. Amen. We have to be the open heart, the open vessel. And here's, here's something that's important for you to understand that you may or may not get. Okay, It's, it's, it's really complicated and only super educated people are going to get this point. Let's see, if I can, let's see if I can break it down and make it simple, okay? You can't fill something that's already full. If something is already full of something else, you can't fill it with something new. And so if you are full of the world, if you are full of, of stuff that does not give long-term satisfaction... I mean, are you eat Chinese food for lunch today? You're going to be hungry again at 2 o'clock. Okay. You, some things are not going to give you long-term satisfaction. And so often we try to fill our lives with the stuff of this world, and it, doesn't, it only satisfies for a moment. And it doesn't give you the long-term satisfaction. And if you are full of other stuff, you are not going to be able to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The other thing I want you to see here, number four, is that we need to keep it up. The, the, when he says be filled, it is not only plural, but it is also in the present tense, which means this. It, means, it means, doesn't just mean be filled, it means keep on being filled. In other words, once is not enough. You say, Pastor, oh, you know, back in 1998, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> wow, that's great. What's been going on since then? What's been going on in the last 17 years of your life? All right? So it's like if you have a huge, you go out after church today and you have a huge meal. You go down to Red Robin and you eat burger heaven, okay? Or, or, you, go, or, or you go to the Hawaiian Cafe and you get loco moco, okay? Uh, you, go, you, know, you go somewhere and you eat some good stuff, all right? And you're like, oh, oh, I can't eat anymore. I'm just all oh, stopped. What about tomorrow? Are you going to say, oh, I ate so much yesterday. I don't need any more today. Yeah. How about Tuesday? Wednesday? Yeah. Oh, I'm still full from Sunday. I ate so much. <laughs> no. You're going to have to eat again. Matter of fact, some of you get full at lunch today, you're going to be hungry again at dinner tonight. You may fill up your gas tank today, but you're going to need to fill it up again in a few days or a week or so. I mean, we need to get filled with the Spirit on a regular basis. There's some husbands and wives, you won't make it out of the parking lot after church today without losing your sanctification. Ooh, we got quiet on that one, didn't it? <laughs> Say, how does he know that? <laughs> Sin and, and people and stuff of life depletes us on a regular basis. So the filling that you just, you had yesterday, you need another one today. That's the thing about being filled with the Spirit is it's something to be, we need to constantly get refilled, just like you need to keep refilling your gas tank and keep refilling your, your tummy, okay? We need that because it's fuel for our lives. And it's vitally important that we have Him in our lives in that way. So 
letter C, what does it mean to be filled? Luke 4.28 says, the, the people of Nazareth were filled with rage at Jesus when he challenged them for their unbelief. All right? Now, if Jesus can preach and people get so mad, they want to throw him off a cliff, okay? I must not be preaching good enough, you know? I, 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 need, I need some of you to, like, gnash at your teeth and grab me and try and throw me in the river or something. <laughs> then I'm really preaching, you know? Then I'm really got it going, okay? But, but notice what they were filled. What were they filled with? Rage. They were filled with rage. You ever been around somebody that's filled with rage? You ever been filled with rage yourself? Acts 13, 45 says the Jews in the Pisidian Antioch became filled with jealousy at the success of Paul and Barnabas. So filled with jealousy were they that they attacked them and blasphemed. These, these Jews were not blasphemed. They probably never blasphemed before, but they got so mad. They got so jealous because everybody was following these guys. And, and they were like, those are supposed to be our followers. Instead, they followed them. And they got so jealous that they wanted to do harm to them. What does that mean? When we use those phrases about being filled, how do we compare those to the Holy Spirit? Well, here's what you need to understand. The, the being filled with something is a matter of control. It's a matter of control. These examples show that being filled means that somebody or something <clears throat> has taken command of your life and is pulling the strings. Have you ever just have you ever said, I just couldn't help myself? Why? What, why could you not help yourself? Are you just using that as an excuse, or could you really not help yourself? If you really couldn't help yourself, then something else had filled you. Jealousy, anger, rage, gluttony. I could not help but eat those maple bacon donuts. Okay. <laughs> could help myself. It's a matter of control. We call it self-control, but it's not, we're not talking about self-control here. We're talking about a different kind of control. It means, number two, it means being controlled by another. Controlled by something or someone else. Let me ask you this question today. What is controlling you? Wine? Rage? Jealousy? Kleptomania? Sexual desire? What is it that controls? Greed? There's a lot of things that if we allow ourselves to be filled with them, they will control you. And so we have to stop and ask that question. You know, when a man gets drunk, another power takes over his life. And he starts doing different things. When someone gets high on weed, another power takes over their life. That's why we say they are under the influence. They start getting loud. They start to sing in inappropriate places. They can't walk a straight line because something else has begun to control their legs. What alcohol is to the body negatively, the Holy Spirit is to the spirit positively. He makes you walk in ways that you would not normally walk and talk in ways that you would not normally talk. When you come under His influence, when you come under the influence and the power and the control of the Holy Spirit, now you're getting filled with the Spirit. You see, when you, when you, when you allow Him to come in and take control, that's when He transforms you. You know, I hear people say, well, Pastor Dave, it's just the way I am. That's my personality. I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit can change your personality. You say, I've always been like this. And I say, it's because you are not under the control of the Spirit. And you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So come under His, His control and come under His influence and let Him make you new. From glory to glory, He's changing us. 
He has predestined us to be conformed into the image of His Son. He wants to make you more and more like Jesus on a daily, regular basis. And the way that we can allow that to happen is we need to to empty ourselves of the the wrong things and let the Spirit of God fill us and, and make us new. The third thing that being filled with the Holy Spirit does is it provides new power. When we yield ourselves to God, He takes care of our transformation. This is, to me, this is a freeing thing. I, I never, I, I, it took me a long time to really understand this. I really thought that, that uh, sanctification or, or becoming more godly was, 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 was my effort. And, and it, was, it, was, it was a real revelation to me when I came to the understanding that it's not about me trying to be good, it's about me yielding to God and letting Him make me good. When we are filled with His Spirit, He releases His power and His influence in our lives. You will start loving people that you used to hate. You will find that the ability to tame your temper that was always out of control. You will be able to say no to immorality. I read last week a study that was done by a biased group. It says that psychological counseling efforts to change a person's sexual orientation are ineffective and dangerous and need to be outlawed. The problem is that some of the things that they mentioned in this study should be outlawed. It's like, you know, making somebody watch gay porn and then shocking them and things like that. And the thing is that that study is based on, a world, on worldly human efforts to overcome these sexual desires. Now, I've talked about this a few times, and in terms of sexual desire, if you have sexual desire that's sinful and inappropriate, that's not a sin in, in and of itself to have the desire. It's a sin to act on it. And, and so what do you do with those? Well, What these studies should have done was not just look at these bizarre techniques that were used in these uh, counseling programs, which were not of God and were were not spiritual, but they were of human technique. Instead, they should go to a group that's called Such Were Some of You. Because this is is a ministry and is a group that has many many documented cases of former homosexuals who have been transformed by the power of God. Of course you can't change a person's sexual proclivities by human effort. But when you get Jesus and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, He can change things. And so what we need to realize is not condemn people outside of the family of God for their, for their ungodly sins, but rather tell them that there is a God who loves them and they need to come and receive Him in their life. Because, once, because if you condemn them, you'll all, you just keep pushing them away. But once you get them in the family of God and say, God can, can, can do a, a mighty work in your life, then He will do the work and He will change you and they'll begin to realize on their own that there is power that's available when they start getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Years ago, when I was pastoring a, a church in Scotts Valley, California, it's right there in Santa Cruz County, just about seven miles from the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Everybody wanted to come visit me. <laughs> and Kim. But uh, we had uh, only been there uh, a few months, and Easter was coming. It was a couple weeks till Easter. And uh, Kim and I wanted to... Uh, try and, and, and reach out to the neighborhood around our church. And we lived in the church parsonage, which was right around the block from the church. And so uh, we decided on that Saturday, two weeks before Easter, to, uh, to just walk the neighborhood. We had some brochures and some information about our church and just invite people to Easter, Easter services and introduce ourselves as the, as the new pastors. And so we did. And uh, we got about four houses down from our own house. 
And, and a lady answers the door, and, and she's, you know, we introduced ourselves and said, yeah, you know, we're the new pastors, and we'd like to invite you to church. And she said, oh, really? She says, uh, so we, the one around the block here said, yeah, that's, that's the church. And she said, oh, okay, well, uh, we'll think about it. And she's about to take the, 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 the brochure. But her husband was sitting on the recliner watching the ball game or whatever, and he jumps up and says, so who are you guys? And uh, we introduced ourselves again, and he said, wow, so you're, you want us to come to your church? We said, yeah, we'd love to have you come. And he said, uh, well, this is for Easter. That's two weeks. Do we have to wait two weeks? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, you can come tomorrow if you like. All right, what time? And, she, and, the, and the wife is like, oh, blah, oh, blah, oh, blah. And he's like, we'll be there tomorrow. Me and my wife and my son, we'll be there. They came. They sat there, seemed to enjoy the service. They came back again on Palm Sunday. And then they came back again on Easter Sunday. And the whole family came down and got saved on Easter Sunday. There was five in the family at that time, yeah. All five of them came to Christ. Now, the father's name was George. And, you know, we were neighbors, and so George and I would see each other from time to time, just walking around, but, but in addition to outside, you know, in addition to being in church. Well, George, I mean, there's people that get saved, and then if, you, if you've ever listened to Carmen, there's people that get radically saved, okay? Well, George got radically saved. Well, this was, uh, you know, on Easter. Well, a couple months later, we started our church softball league, and George is like, Man, I want to get out there and play some ball. I haven't played in a while. You know, he wasn't very good. But, uh, but he, he could pitch. He ended up becoming our pitcher. Well, the first day we're out there at practice, you know, he's getting all into it. And then uh, we decided that, you know, the, the, the last practice before we were going to start our games, that we would have a big pizza party for all the, uh, all the ball team. Well, there was a round table right there in Scotts Valley. And, uh, and so George says, are we going to go to the round table? And I said, yeah. He says, all right, I'll go, I'll go get it set up. And I'm like, I'll go get us a t- uh, some tables. You know, we had a whole bunch of us coming. So we get there, and the round table in Scotts Valley has a basement. Uh, at least the, the old one did. The new one doesn't. But the, the, it had a basement where you go in, and, and there's a, like a, a private, you know, meeting room where you could have parties and things like that. And so, so we get there, and George had gotten the entire uh, bottom of the, of the thing reserved for our, for our group. We get there and walk in, and George's like, come on, come on, come on. And we all get there and go downstairs, and he's got like two or three pitchers of beer <laughs> on all the tables. He, George has a pack of cigarettes rolled up in his sleeve. And, uh, you know, he's newly saved, and, uh, and, and, but it, it, nobody said a word. Everybody said, thanks, George. But I think George re- noticed something was a little off when nobody drank any of the beer. So, uh, so that was fine. We had a great time. People just loved on George. George became a real uh, important part of the church. He was there every time the doors were opened. He was there. And, uh, and Debbie and his son, and they, he got, his son got involved in Royal Rangers. And it was just a, just a really, real blessing to see the really kind of rapid growth that was starting to happen in their lives. Well, about six months after Easter, um, I was outside uh, in the front yard, I think I was, I don't know if I was mowing the lawn or washing the car or something, and, and, uh, and George is walking his dog, and he comes by the house, and he says, Pastor Dave, he said, uh, can I talk to you about something? I said, sure, George, what's up? He says, uh, you know, he says, uh, now that I'm a Christian, he said, I don't, I don't, I don't think I should be smoking anymore. And I said, George, I said, did somebody tell you that? No. Has somebody, has somebody t- you know, talked to you about your smoking? No, nobody said a word. He says, I, I just feel uncomfortable doing that. So he quit smoking that day. No long withdrawal process, just boom, he just quit smoking. And he said, you know, I, I, I really feel uncomfortable. I don't think I should be drinking either. I said, really, George? I said, did somebody tell you that that was, a, that was wrong? He says, no. He said, um, I think the Holy Spirit told me that. And 
And I said, well, George, I said, that's, you know, that's just between you and God. And he said, I know. He said, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna drink anymore either. And on that day, George quit smoking and he quit drinking and nobody ever said a word to him. Nobody ever condemned him. He certainly didn't get it from me. The church just loved him. And yet somehow as he got filled with the spirit and God began to work in his life, things changed in his heart. And God began to do things in him. George became a very passionate soul winner. George was bringing people to church on a regular basis. George became so hungry for the Word of God, he went to every Bible study he could go to. He got starving for the things of God. About, I think about four or five, about five years later, George got elected to the board of our church because he had become such a powerful, on-fire Christian for God. Everybody in the church saw the transformation that had taken place in George's life. As a matter of fact, we, uh, when the Lord led us to, away from this church to Santa Rosa, California. We were gone for 10 years. We came back to Scotts Valley for a couple of years to work with a missionary organization. And uh, we, we, we'd barely gotten our, our, our truck unloaded and George show, showed up at our house. And he said, he said, do you want, he says, hey, we're, we're gonna go to a Bible study tonight, Pastor, you wanna go? I mean, he was just, he was just so passionate for God. God had just gotten a hold of it. This guy was filled with the Holy Spirit every day because he became so hungry for God. You say, Pastor, are you telling us not to drink or smoke? I'm not saying a word. I didn't say a word to George. But the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I want something different from you. Now, how do we get filled with the Spirit? Four ways. In the verses that I read to you that were after the verse that says, be filled with the Spirit, he says a number of things. Now, I had to look at this, and there's two ways to look at this. He says, be filled with the Spirit, and then in verse 19 he says, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing and make music in your heart, always give thanks to God for the Father and everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are those qualities the result of being filled or are they the means to being filled? And the more I read through those verses, I began to think, no, those aren't the result of being filled. Those are the means of being filled. Let me walk through those four with you real quick. Number one, speaking to one another. You know, the reason that many believers are not experiencing the Holy Spirit's fullness in their daily lives is that they have no room for Him. Their conversations are full of sports, politics, business, and the weather, or whatever. We need to encourage each other with spiritual talk. Amen. Spiritual talk. My grandmother, who died a few years ago, six weeks before her 100th birthday. I got a feeling I have her genes in me. <clears throat> but six weeks before her 100th birthday. My grandma, you could not spend five minutes with my grandmother without her talking about the Lord. Every time I would see her, I mean, it may have been months since I've seen her. We haven't had a conversation on the phone or anything. And I walk up and she's, you know, gives me a big hug. And then she says, so David, you think the rapture's going to happen soon? Yeah. Or, or she'd say, yeah, your Uncle Tom, we need, to, we need to pray for him. We need to pray for your Uncle Tom. And I'm like, okay, Grandma, let's pray. And she says, all right, let's do it right now. I mean, she could not talk about anything but Jesus. She'd say, I was reading in the scriptures this morning these verses. Can you help me? Under what do you think they mean, David? <coughs> that was my grandma. I'm, I'm a Christian today because my backslidden mother was not going to church. My grandmother came and picked me up at the age of six years old and took me to Sunday school and to church. And I got saved at the age of six in a Sunday school class because my grandmother took me and prayed for me. I'm in the ministry today because of my grandmother influence in my life. All she could talk about was Jesus. My grandmother was filled with the Holy Spirit every day because she sought it and she spoke it on a regular basis. Secondly, we need to communicate with the Lord. He says, make melody in your heart. In her Dear Abby newspaper column, 
Uh, Abby shares a letter from uh, R.T. Holland of Los Angeles who tells of an article from a medical section of the Time magazine. The magazine cited a man who went to a psychiatrist complaining that he was always hearing radio broadcasts. Thinking to humor him, the psychiatrist asked him what he was hearing right then. The man replied that he was hearing Rudy Valley broadcasting from the Steel Pier in, the, in Atlantic City. After much questioning, he discovered that the man worked in a glass bottle factory and had gotten some of the silica crystals in his dental cavities. The combination of the silica, saliva, and some bridge work in his mouth had literally transformed him into a walking crystal radio receiver. So the psychiatrist referred the patient to a dentist who gave his teeth a thorough cleaning, filled the cavities, and redid the bridge work. As a result, the patient went off the air and was able to concentrate and live happily ever after. You know what? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's like you are got a receiver built in, and you just, the song and the music and the flowing of worship is amazing. A uh, former member of my church in Scotts Valley posted something on Facebook this morning that I, I happened to uh, repost. And it was, uh, <clears throat> uh, you, you know, we sing, we sing Revelation song here. It's one of our favorite songs to sing here. And, and, uh, but this version of it, it was a video, was every, every line of the song was sung in a different language. And people just kept stepping up and stepping up and stepping up and sit, you know, they would have German and Finnish and, and they would have, you know, Taiwan and they would have Jap Japanese and Korean and they would have, all these different people got up and they would sing a different line of the song and they had the English underneath it but they had the, they had the, the you know, the foreign language there or the different language there. And I thought at that moment, wow, heaven is going to be like that. Singing the praises of God in the language we know. The third thing that we need to do to be filled with the Spirit is to give thanks in everything, for everything in Jesus' name. When you talk to God, how do you talk to Him? Do you talk with Him with gratitude or with grumbling? Why, God, why? Is the only time God hears from you when you want something? Because if it is, you'll never be filled with the Spirit. We need to come to God and it says, it, what, what does the psalmist say? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. And I will enter his courts with praise. praise. That's how we come in. It's when we are coming with an open, thankful, grateful heart that we begin to open up all the power and the blessings of God to flow into us. And then finally, number four is be subject to one another. You say, how does that get us filled with the Spirit? It means, do you live with a servant heart toward others? This is vital. You want to see the, the, the power of God flow out of you, not just into you. In order to get filled, we need to be giving out. If all we're doing is getting filled so that we can sit there fat and sassy and say, yep, I'm full. No, we get filled so that we'll have energy so that we can go out and do the things of God. And so when we are servant-hearted and we reflect Christ and we give out to other people, then the Spirit fills us continuously over and over and over. It's like the, the Dead Sea. We know the Dead Sea in Israel. It's a dead sea because the water flows in, but it doesn't flow out. And so you need the Spirit of God flowing out of you by being servant-hearted. So what is our problem? The problem is we are not thirsty enough. We need to be thirsty for the things of God. Too often I hear people that are they're bored with daily devotions, it's difficult to be faithful. Eh, I'm just too busy to be in church. Let me ask you to do this. Just give God your day. When you wake up in the morning, say, God, fill me up with all you are. This is your day. And then here's what I want you to do, too. <clears throat> I want you to hang around with others who are getting drunk. 
so that you can get drunk together. <laughs> Say what? In the spirit. Hang around those who are getting drunk in the spirit so you can get drunk in the spirit together. Oh, I forgot that line. I had to add that. As you get drunk together. Hallelujah. <laughs> and here's something. Make singing a regular part of your life. I don't care what the people in the car next to you think. Belt it out. Praise the Lord right there in your car while people are looking at you strange. All right, I want to close with this story. Dr. Bill Bright, I don't know how many of you know him. He, uh, he passed away a couple years ago. He was the president of Campus Crusade for Christ and a, a great soul winner. He told a story once about during the Great Depression, that there was a field that was a sheep ranch, and it was owned by a man by the name of Yates. Mr. Yates was not able to make enough on his ranching to pay the principal and the interest on the mortgage. And so he was in danger of losing his ranch. With little money for clothes or food, his family, like many others, had to live on government subsidies. Day after day, as he grazed his sheep over those rolling West Texas hills, he was no doubt greatly troubled about how he would pay his bills. Then a seismographic crew from an oil company came into the area and told him that there might be oil on his land. They asked permission to drill a wildcat well. He signed the lease contract. At 1,115 feet, they struck a huge oil reserve. The first well came in at 80,000 barrels a day. Many subsequent wells were more than twice as large. In fact, 30 years after the discovery, a government test of one of the wells showed that it still had the potential flow of 125,000 barrels a day. Mr. Yates owned it all. The day he purchased the land, he had also received the oil and the mineral rights. He had been living on government relief. A multimillionaire, billionaire, living in poverty because he didn't know that he had the oil right there. Here's where I want to challenge you today. You've got something more powerful than that oil well, more worth more than that oil well that Mr. Yates had. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's already there in your life if you know him as Savior. And there is an unlimited reserve of power, an unlimited reserve of his great wealth to flow right into your life, into your circumstances, into every burden that's, that's got you heavy today. And right now, he wants you to be filled with his spirit so that he can do mighty things. Would you stand with me, please? I want to do this simply. Now, I'm not going to invite anybody forward today. I'm just going to tell you right where you're at because I think we all need it. I'm not going to ask for some people to come. I want everybody to receive this. So right where you're standing, right where you're at, would you just invite the Holy Spirit to come fill you right now? And if you need to empty out your, your own bitterness or your own agenda or whatever it is, if you need to just release some of that so that the Spirit of God can come in and have full control, go ahead and do that. Just let Him have that right now. Because I know He wants to do something amazing in your life today. But you've got to let Him have control. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. 
Nothing can compare your unliving hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and, and my shame, shame is undone And your presence, Lord And Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come and flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence alone, your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope and your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Oh Lord, in your presence, Lord We sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come and and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your prayer oh sing Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are welcome here come and flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory, God. What our hearts are long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. In your presence, Lord. Sing, let us become. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your good. Sing, let us become, let us become. Aware of your presence, let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Come and flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord.
presence in us, around us, in our world, in our homes, in our workplaces. Lord, fill us to overflowing with your spirit today. Lord, that we might allow you to have full control. That we might allow you, Lord God, to permeate every part of our lives. Oh, Lord God, we give you the glory. We give you the praise for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go and let Jesus flow out of you wherever you go. Amen. Amen.